Hello, uh, welcome again. Uh, um, I'm really pleased to be able to um, deliver these lectures and uh, I wanna thank uh, the organizers for inviting me and for all of you for such perceptive questions during the first two lectures. I hope that continues today. Um, today, um, I'm gonna be talking about the MBL transition uh, so this, in contrast to the previous two days, which were basically describing some mathematical theorems that I proved um, relating to the existence of the MBL phase, uh, this is a purely theoretical construction, many, many approximations going on which are uncontrolled in, in contrast to the um, analysis in the previous two days. Um, but nevertheless, I think it's a compelling picture for actually what goes on in the MBL transition. Uh, leads us to an uh, understanding of what sort of um, uh, critical exponents can be expected uh, at the transition for this phenomenon. And in fact, uh, we'll see that these, uh, we have a Costa-Lazalis type flow equation, as was alluded to before, but it is not actually in the Costa-Lazalis universality class. So um, actually some, some people, Grouped all, there was, there's been several papers on the KT universality um, or KT-like um, as proposals for the critical behavior of the MBL, but um, uh, <coughs> they shouldn't all be lumped together <laughs> because this paper that, um, that I'm gonna be discussing here, Morningstar, Hughes, Embry, PRE 2020, is distinct from the other proposals in that the divergence is not of the correlation length, if you will, correlation divergence. Although it obeys nu equals infinity, like KT, the actual form of the divergence is distinct from that of KT. <laughs> so I'm gonna uh, give a sort of a brief uh, recap of what we saw in the MBL pr proof. In fact, much of the ideas behind this paper were based upon various constructions, avalanches and uh, uh, buffer zones, things like that, that um, were already present in my MBL proof. And it's a matter of extracting those and uh, seeing what their implications are for the critical phenomenon when we get away from the regime of uh, extremely large disorder, which was considered in the proof. Um, so we'll introduce a simplified picture with just thermalized and localized intervals. And then, uh, as I said, we'll understand exactly how that leads to this KT type phenomena at the transition. So getting right into it, this is um, essentially a slide from yesterday's talk um, as a way of recapping and introducing the ideas that when we have a resonant region, we, just, we learned that we needed a buffer zone um, and although these spins among themselves are not, don't exhibit resonance, what happens is uh, level spacing of the resonant region is so large that you need an extremely distant interaction um, before you get to the perturbative regime where the um, interaction strength is much smaller than the level spacing. And in fact, there's a competition because in fact, as you add the buffer zone, the volume of this thermalized region continues to increase, which means the level spacing continues to decrease. But as long as the decay rate is um, faster than this critical value, which was predicted in the um, theories on the avalanche, eventually you'll win out and these buffer zones will um, be uh, overcome and we'll get it back into the perturbative region. Of course, if, the, if we go toward the TOWIT transition, this uh, decay rate is gonna creep down towards this critical value. And that means these buffer zones will have a tendency to become larger and larger. And this is sort of this, um, uh, <coughs> and very quickly, in fact, the whole thing just um, thermalizes the buffer zones sort of take over all of volume. And that's the nature of the transition uh, in this approach. All right, so um, again, recapping from yesterday, um, in RG terms, when we rotate terms away in the Hamiltonian up to a given order in perturbation theory, it's kind of like integrating out short distance degrees of freedom in traditional RG. 
So it's not too surprising that the basic ideas behind this construction can be encapsulated into some sort of approximate RG flow, and that's what our task is for today. Um, and I've already mentioned about these buffer zones, uh, but let me um, mention these two effects here, uh, sort of competing effects. Uh, on the one hand, when in the RG, the smaller resonant regions reduces the density. Um, somehow the idea is that the density of resonant regions should go to zero in the RG if you're in the MBL phase. And they should blow up if you're in the thermalized phase. So you have two effects. Um, as we saw in the RG, we eliminate in the smaller resonant regions, together with their buffer zone, they become perturbative. So they're no longer really resonant on that length scale. On the other hand, um, we need these buffer zones, which fattens up the buffer zones um, on those regions which remain. And this can actually cause neighboring resonant blocks to merge. I didn't emphasize this yesterday, but that's certainly an important um, effect. And I guess I did draw that one diagram of this sort of hierarchical organization of nearby buffer zones, which is related to this effect. So you can imagine that when two buffer zones merge, you get a much bigger buffer zone. And of course, the, that tends to increase the overall density of resonant regions. So in my proof, I understood, I was able to show that effect number one, this reduction in density dominates two, deep in the weak coupling or strong disorder regime, and density goes to zero. But okay, now we're interested in the critical behavior, so we need to understand the interplay between effects number one and number two in detail. Now, let me remind you about the avalanche effect. Um, so there's these exponentials, which uh, for matrix elements connecting the resonant region with spins outside. And they're gonna decay with some exponential, which I'll write as two to the minus two L over zeta, where zeta is some decay length. Um, so for this to be small compared to the level spacing, remember I said the level spacing that's relevant is when you combine the core region with the buffer zone. If the buffer zone has width L, then the combined buffer zone on both sides has total size two L. So this is the level spacing of, of the uh, whole region. Um, and in order for this effect here, either two to the minus two L over zeta to be small compared to that, we certainly are gonna need to have zeta inverse greater than one because otherwise this exponential could never dominate this one. So let's define X to be the excess decay rate, the difference between zeta inverse and one. And so then we can, equate uh, this first phenomenon in terms of X, it looks like this. And then we try to compare that with the level spacing. And we find that the buffer zone size much satisfy L greater than or equal to R over two X. So this is very interesting as, as you might expect, as this parameter X goes to zero, as we expect it will, as we head toward the toward transition, the size of this buffer zone and the ratio between the core area and the thermalized area uh, grows like one over X, a very strong divergence. Um, so at some point then, when you increase um, the parameter, um, which remember gamma was our, my small parameter that I introduced rapid exponential decay into the problem yesterday. <clears throat> but if you increase gamma, um, effect number two will dominate one. That means from the previous slide, the, the fattening effect will <coughs> dominates the eliminations and the density of resonant regions uh, grows to zero with L. So that's the fundamental, um, basically this is a theory for an avalanche based um, transition from MBL to a uh, ETH phase. All right, so uh, <coughs> obviously um, we need to make some simplifications. Uh, be to get to really some kind of manageable flow equations to understand the critical behavior. <clears throat> so at a given cutoff, um, we're going to uh, basically, remember I said this is a, a theory of avalanche driven transition. So in the avalanche theory, you have a basically thermalized regions and localized regions. So we can think of the timeline or the, the spatial line of the walk uh, 
as being um, composed of alternating blocks of thermalized blocks and insulating or um, localized blocks. So we call those, obviously, L blocks are the localized blocks and T blocks are the thermalized blocks. If you're in the MBL region, then these T blocks should be rare. But if you're going toward the transition, the T blocks will begin to take over the whole volume. <laughs> and we're going to also introduce a length scale. This is a, a running length scale for the renormalization group. I'm going to call that lambda. By the way, this um, division of the problem into alternating localized and thermalized blocks um, is something that has had been studied over I don't know, let's say five to seven years, there have been numerous models of these alternating T blocks and L blocks, which were introduced in some attempts, early attempts to understand the critical behavior of the RG. And there was continued improvements, uh, incorporating more of the actual physics of the model into these, um, into these alternating block models. And <clears throat> uh, so obviously I, um, this work basically builds on those earlier works, I've just basically tuned it up. Um, the three of us tuned it up in such a way as to uh, really encap encapsulate um, even more of the physics. <clears throat> um, so, but there's an assumption here that you know may or may not be true, right? So, basically, this whole picture assumes, but by modality, that there's really a sort of a strong distinction between T blocks and L blocks is strongly attractive near the transition. That as you go toward the transition, uh, this picture of alternating blocks gets better and better. Um, another important assumption here, which we'll have some more to talk about later, is that the decay rate is constant in space. Now this is, of course, a random system, and um, all the disorder variables differ from space to space. There's no particular reason to expect Although, you know, the decay rate could be defined as some kind of asymptotic thing, what in practice we're looking at it locally. Um, and we're just making the assumption this is constant in space. And although this approximation can be justified near the transition using Chase Harris arguments. So, um, so anyway, once we've solved for the uh, length divergence, then we can go back and say, well, is this assumption valid or not? And, it, and um, Turns out it is. All right, so let me just uh, recap how this works. So remember I was talking about block merging. So if a T block, a thermalized block, these are the rare events, at least if you're in the MBL phase, is not isolated, then it appears with a neighboring T block that lies within a distance lambda over X form a larger T block. So this is what it means to be isolated. If a block is isolated, if the distance to the next one is greater than lambda over X, and so this is an important feature. We put in a factor of 1 over x because the notion of isolation depends upon the size of the buffer zone, right? And as I just indicated a couple of slides ago, um, the size of the buffer zone is proportional to 1 over x. So when the RG cutoff is lambda, the separation between these blocks is enforced to be lambda over x, a much larger separation. So, uh, physically speaking, these blocks that are too close to the neighboring blocks do not have enough room to localize separately. There's not enough room for each of them to have their, um, their buffer zone and then to be eliminated from the RG. Now, the avalanche parameter, x, this is the, remember, x was the um, excess decay rate. This is going to flow downward with the RG blocks. And the physics of that we've already discussed in previous lectures. This has to do with the, when you get rid of a T block, um, even though you've gotten rid of the T block from the RG, um, it remains there in the, graphically and creates short circuits on the exponential decay. <clears throat> this was an effect which I was able to overcome using um, those methods, if you recall from yesterday's talk, going back to Earl Spencer, 1983, that interruptions in decay can be handled, provided the starting decay rate is extremely large, and the amount that you lose in each step forms some kind of convergence series. If you start at a large value and you lose a convergence series of decay, 
you still end up with a strictly positive decay rate. Uh, but <laughs> anyway, so this is going to flow down with, with the RG for that very, um, for the same region, reason. <laughs> so <laughs> one can actually incorporate these rules into a detailed functional renormalization group equation. Um, this is something that uh, Morningstar and Hughes and others uh, had been working on uh, and trying to understand, they, they were trying to understand these types of equations um, numerically. Re functional RG equations, as you can see, <laughs> they're a little bit hard to, to swallow uh, and to analyze analytically, so sometimes you end up having to look at them uh, numerically. They're, they are very powerful equations, though. They really incorporate non-perturbative information into the RG, which is often missing uh, when you approach RG from a purely perturbative perspective. Well, so, yeah, let me um, <laughs> go through this a little bit. I, I don't expect you to follow this whole equation in detail, but, um, uh, and in fact, <clears throat> this whole picture is really not necessary to, d to derive the form of the um, critical behavior. In fact, um, in early work, um, I was able to basically use uh, general arguments, which we'll see in a moment, um, to uh, basically come up with an approximate two-parameter flow, which mimics these equations. Uh, and from that two-parameter flow, you can then see the critical behavior. But <clears throat> one can always question those um, heuristic arguments. So very often you can make a heuristic argument, it sounds reasonable, but maybe to one person, but not to another. It's nice to be able to back it up with the analytical arguments, and that's what this is for. By the way, you know, um, but <clears throat> can you get getting back to the subject of functional RG, if this is unfamiliar to some of you, um, you may have seen similar kinds of functional RGs in the context of uh, hierarchical models. Um, <clears throat> which uh, have been used um, successfully over um, for, for decades, really, uh, to understand critical behavior of models, to simplify the complicated RG with a <laughs> simple picture of like merging two blocks into one, um, and with some simplified form of the interaction. What this typically involves then is some kind of a convolution. Uh, so you take the interaction term from one scale, it ends up getting convolved with itself in, in some way according to the functional um, RG, and then you try to re-express the new interaction in a similar way. Um, <coughs> likewise, here we see we have this, con oops, uh, we see we have a convolution piece. This is a convolution piece. Um, <coughs> But what we can do, and typically this is what you try to do whenever you have an infinite dimensional dynamical system, which of course is what this is, this is a function, right? So this flow equation represents a flow in an infinite dimensional space, is you try to um, reduce the dimensionality from infinitely many degrees of freedom, functional RG, to a manageable um, two or three degrees of freedom, which are the mo ones that are most relevant for the problem. And so that's um, what we're going to be doing as well. But, it's, but anyway, with this introduction to the functional RG, let me introduce the parameters uh, that come into it. This, this capital R lambda denotes the rate for an exponential distribution. So basically, the, we're assuming that the T blocks are basically appearing as a kind of a Poisson process in space. So they're ex the exponential dis distribution in space for each subsequent t-block. And that exponential distribution is going to have a rate, which is basically telling us what the density of these t-blocks are, um, or the density of left endpoints, if you will. Not necessarily, doesn't take into account the volume of the t-block. Anyway, so capital R lambda is going to be the rate for this exponential distribution, which means, of course, this is the exponential distribution. This is the probability. Um, that the length of the intervening L block lies in this range between lambda over x 
plus w and lambda over x plus w plus dw. So now this rate can be further breaking down because the t block that appears can have a variety of different lengths. Um, so we'll do, use this curly L to denote the length of the T block that appears after the L block. And so we can break down the overall rate for appearance of T blocks into an integral over possible lengths, little l, of some rate parameter, rate function, r lambda of L. So if you will, r lambda of L is a, a really a double rate because it's a rate with respect to L and it's and the even after you integrate over L, it's still a rate uh, in space. <laughs> so actually, little r has dimensions 1 over L squared. Capital R has dimensions 1 over L. And this is clear as well from this expression. OK, so as I said, um, anytime you have a um, uh, complicated RG involving an infinite dimensional uh, space of parameters, uh, you want to reduce to the key parameters. So we're going to reduce to two key parameters. Remember, this is a sort of um, KT-like transition. So as in the KT transition, we're going to have an X and a Y. <laughs> Those of you who are familiar with the standard uh, terminology for the parameters in, um, in KT. So <laughs> To begin with, remember I said this has dimensions 1 over length squared. So it makes sense to define a dimensionless rate by putting in two factors of the running RG parameter, lambda squared, R lambda. And of course, R, little r lambda uh, has an argument L, right? But um, little l runs from lambda to infinity. But we'll just take it at its left endpoint uh, to define this important parameter y. And we've already seen the x parameter, that's the deficit decay rate. Now, we believe that when the deficit decay rate uh, or the excess decay rate reaches zero, then the MBL phase is kaput, right? So this is very similar to the situation in the KT phase diagram, that you have this line of fixed points. So we have, we have x and we have y. And then we have this line of fixed points here when x equals zero and y is greater than or equal to 0. And the flow, we believe, is going to be going something like this. Whenever the flow is driven down to this fixed line, uh, the density, y, is 0. So that means you're in the MBL phase. On the other hand, if the lines go over this way, and they, they quickly run out to the point where you can no longer trust the, the equations, but they might go off to infinity, they might go into the y-axis, whatever they do, if they're not going down here, um, uh, <coughs> uh, then you're going to be in the thermalized phase. Okay, so now as, as I promised a moment ago, I'm going to try to use some uh, general arguments uh, to produce a two-parameter flow equation. So what we're going to say is that the dominant mode of production of T blocks of size lambda over x should be the combination of component T blocks of size close to lambda. So what am I saying here? That if, we, um, if we're going to form a T block like this, the dominant mode, meaning the, most, uh, the least unlikely mode, is going to be obtained by having these component T blocks be as small as possible because the probability goes to zero quite rapidly as you increase the size of these T blocks. So if you want the most likely way of producing a long T block, it's obtained by taking small sub blocks at the, at the uh, distance needed to create this um, combined block. So here's again this picture that I was just drawing. Um, <coughs> we're, we're basically producing a T block at the, at the size lambda over x. And I'm producing it by merging these two sub blocks. Now I'm, I'm fixing the size, so that means the left endpoint and the right endpoint here is fixed. And so consequently, these sub blocks will also have this endpoint and that endpoint fixed. But the interior endpoints are free to roam. <laughs> 
that's an important thing because so this recursion relation that I'm coming up with here expresses the double rate r lambda at lambda over x in terms of the square of the overall rate capital R lambda. Okay, I hope this the reason for that is clear. It's, again, it's because of the fact that the lengths here um, going inwards for each of these component blocks um, can be anything, and they would still produce the same overall um, T block when they merge. And dimensionally, this is uh, correct as well. You could probably just derive this equation just by dimensional analysis, because I said this is dimensions 1 over length squared, and each factor of R has dimensions 1 over length. And it, <clears throat> this is extremely important, because um, uh, this dimensional analysis ends up percolating through the whole picture and de really defines uh, the nature of the, the um, flow equations. Now, another important thing is that this rate here, R lambda of L, uh, really shouldn't depend very much on lambda between XL and L. Because this bas basically, this argument for how to form blocks the next scale um, is valid throughout a whole range of cutoffs, capital lambda, uh, up to the point where you, where the, it come, gets to the point where you, it's actually more efficient to merge even smaller little blocks like this. Anyway, so, so this is uh, an important uh, point, is um, <clears throat> the dependence on lambda um, is fairly weak. And so then by dimensional reasons, uh, it's going to be basically this parameter y over L squared. Um, so there is a certain decay <laughs> in this probability rate with L, which is kind of universal um, based on dimensional analysis. And this should be valid between lambda and lambda over x. Um, and likewise, when you integrate this, of course, um, if you integrate 1 over L squared, you know what you get. <laughs> um, you get 1 over L. So that gives us this factor of lambda um, to relate R, capital R lambda and little r lambda. Again, this, is, this factor, some kind of length factor is needed by fundamental analysis, and so naturally it's going to be a factor of lambda. So <clears throat> I'm not sure if everyone followed all these, this, these details, but at the end of the day, um, when we take this fundamental relationship and we do a little dimensional analysis, we can relate the dimension-free parameter y at the scale lambda over x with y at scale lambda. So first, we basically plug in this relationship between um, the definition of y in terms of little r. And then we <coughs> apply some of these approximations to that. We relate r, little r to big R using this equation. And then we, um, we, we express everything in, the, in terms of um, <coughs> uh, <coughs> using the dimensional analysis. And then we get back basically just pulling out these factors of 1 over x squared, because the length here is obviously much larger than the original length. <laughs> at the end of the day, you're back with y at the next scale is related to y at the initial scale squared, but divided by x squared. So it's kind of an interesting RG, actually, because um, when you think about RG normally, you say, OK, we're going to jump scale by a factor of 2, let's say, with each step of the RG. But this RG is a little bit different because one of the flowing parameters, this x parameter, actually determines the jump in scale. And so as x gets smaller and smaller, the scale jump with each step of the RG gets bigger and bigger. So here, for example, I've, I've described the, the merging of two distant um, t blocks into 1, and the distance here is basically proportion, it's lambda over x, so it's proportional to 1 over x. As the parameter x flows to 0 in the RG, the separation, of course, as we've already discussed, gets bigger and bigger, so uh, the jump in scale uh, with each step of the RG gets bigger and bigger. Okay, so this is the key equation here. Let me rewrite it here. <clears throat> 
It's a very simple relationship between the density, the dimensionless density of blocks at scale lambda over x with uh, the corresponding density at scale lambda. Everything expressed in terms of um, basically 1 over x, which is sort of the, the length scale over which these block combinations are performed. And in fact, um, although you can derive this by sort of pure reasoning, <laughs> uh, you can also confirm these equations quantitatively by analyzing those functional RG equations. So this is a really important uh, part of the uh, paper, which is to justify these arguments using this um, much more rigorously um, constructed um, functional RG. You can already see here that the, um, for example, uh, this first equation, by the way, we, okay, we have two um, parameters, x and y, right? So we need the flow of x. Uh, here it is, it's lambda dx d lambda is minus y. So this is saying that the, the density of uh, resonant blocks has a tendency to decrease um, this excess decay rate, right? So that's the phone that we've been talking about all along, right? The rule of halted decay. So <clears throat> these, com these two equations, this one and this one, are basically encapsulate uh, this functional RG. The first equation actually looks very much like this one. And if, <clears throat> with, with an appropriate approximation, namely that y and y over x are small, it's quite easy to show that this equation reduces to that one. Um, this one, in, which involves the convolution, um, is a little bit more involved in its discussion, but at the end of the day, it's uh, um, just, you know, less than a page of analysis uh, to demonstrate that um, we can get this equation out of that one. Okay, so now uh, let's say we believe this is the appropriate simplified RG flow in the problem. Um, let me rewrite them, dx dt equals minus y. This is now using traditional time as the log of this length scale to parameterize the RG. Remember we had here lambda d by d lambda, and so now that just becomes dx dt. And y is y over x squared. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, this uh, equation for x represents a decrease in decay rate due to the erasure of t blocks at cutoff lambda, otherwise known as the rule of halted decay. Now let's try to understand um, the behavior of this, of this um, dynamical system. We want to know where the separatrix is. And, um, uh, well, <laughs> actually by dimensional analysis, you know, it's y, y over x squared. We kind of believe, uh, it seems likely that the curve y of equals x squared is the separate tricks. And indeed, if you start with the, um, on a little bit higher, actually this is a little bit lower than the separate tricks, slightly flatter parabola, and then you do one iteration of these equations. Remember this, this is actually not a flow in the traditional sense, it's kind of a mix between a continuous flow, but this is a recursion. So we're really only taking snapshots of the flow um, every, uh, every, every time the uh, length scale is jumped by a factor of 1 over x. So if we do one of those jumps in scale um, by a factor of 1 over x, the curve y equals x to the 2 plus delta, and it's easy to work this out, just plug it in, you end up on the curve very close to the curve y equals 2 to the x plus 2 delta. Uh, the true actually delta positive or negative. So we've basically bracketed the separate tricks. We clearly have divergence away from the separate tricks y equals x squared. Uh, quite strong exponential divergence away from the separate tricks um, as the RG proceeds. Once we know the separate tricks, we can actually solve for the flow along it, and we find these power law behaviors for x and y. And of course, y now has to be x squared, which it certainly is. And now this gives the first indication. Remember, t is the, um, the logarithm of the length scale. So this is a very slow evolution in the RG parameters. 
Now, when you're below the supertrix, uh, essentially, we're in this picture where, actually, let me redraw this picture now, along with the separatrix, right? So we have the separatrix y equals x squared. And the flow initially begins to diverge. Eventually, you're going to get, at least on the downside, you're going to get to um, very close to the line of fixed points. And then <clears throat> at that point, x is going to freeze. Right? You're, going to, you're going to head down toward, vertically, essentially, toward the uh, fixed line. And the scale jumps, as I said earlier, are a factor of um, x inverse. And this leads to a prediction for the fractal dimension, if you will, for these um, resonant regions, which is log 2 over log x inverse. Actually, this fractal dimension is something that has been considered for many years in the context of um, numerics and theory for the NBL phase. And um, so it pops out of this RG as well. So, and also it's worth pointing out that near and below the separatrix, we do indeed have y over x small, as long as y is small. So these are the two key approximations <coughs> that I needed, here we go, <coughs> to reduce these equations to that one. I needed y and y over x are small, and that's certainly valid um, below the separatrix and near the separatrix. All right, so. Now that we understand um, <clears throat> quite a few details about this RG flow, it's natural to start asking questions about um, the diverging length associated with the flow. So you may define a diverging length as the point where an orbit departs the vicinity of a separatrix from an initial small displacement delta zero. Obviously, if you're right on the separatrix, you're going to go all the way down. Um, uh, <laughs> to the point zero, zero. But if you're even slightly away, you're going to eventually depart either above or below the separatrix. And, it, and, and if you're extremely close, if delta zero is really tiny, then it will take a long time um, to depart from the separatrix. Uh, so you can actually solve the, um, for the, gener the, the form of this divergence. And it has this rather unusual form here involving delta zero to a double log of delta zero. Now, just for comparison, in the traditional um, critical phenomenon, when you, you try to define the correlation length exponent nu by essentially looking at this equation, lambda goes like delta zero to the minus nu. So this quantity in the exponent is traditionally um, a constant. Right? I mean, there are corrections, but you know, there's a leading behavior is a constant, which defines the correlation length exponent nu. But what we see here is that, in fact, this constant is not a constant. It just keeps getting larger and larger as you get closer and closer to the separate tricks. And this behavior is um, uh, also what you see in the traditional costulet stylus transition, where the divergence is, however, is of a different form. It's, uh, it also involves effectively nu equals infinity, but it looks like the exponential of delta zero to the minus a half. <laughs> so yeah, so, um, so that obviously I have a lot invested in, <laughs> in these equations. I've been very fond of them, but um, please don't confuse the fact the KT divergence with the divergence we found here. Um, we're in a, actually a, a rather different universality class. And in fact, the, the, as I'll talk about in a moment, the overall structure, the reason is, is actually closely connected to the nature of the divergence uh, of the departures from the separatrix in this um, system as compared to the costulet stylus system. <clears throat> uh, roughly speaking, the, as we found already in, this, um, in the previous slide, the departure um, yeah, over here we talked about the departure being exponential, right? X to the 2 plus delta goes to X to the 2 plus 2 delta, and then it'll be to X to the 2 plus 4 delta, and so forth. So the rate of departures 
from the separatrix is exponential in the number of steps of the RG. Whereas when you go to the KT flow, it's not only slow along the separatrix, but it's also slow in departing from the separatrix. Um, so, uh, this, um, so this is the fundamental reason why the form of the, for example, of the correlation length exponent it has this uh, odd double logarithmic uh, form. The extra log form comes in because of this, uh, the fact that X itself is flowing logarithmically, so the jumps get larger and larger, the closer and closer you get to the origin. Um, <clears throat> by the way, you can also kind of define a volume or length dependent uh, correlation length exponent. Um, essentially what, we'd, what you would do is take this traditional relationship defining the exponent nu, but then solve for nu as a function of lambda when we consider delta also as a function of lambda, as you can see it is from this equation here. Um, so when you do that, you can get an effective nu as a function of lambda, um, which is of this form. It's a double log of lambda. So yeah, by the, so you know, this is, um, this is actually an important uh, conceptual concept because you know, at some level when people start evaluating, uh, trying to extract numerically a critical exponent, I think in this, certainly in this MBL problem and many other, possibly other problems, it's important to recognize that the correlation like exponent that you see in a box um, is going to actually depend on the size of that block, of that box when you work numerically. And actually, um, um, <clears throat> but this double log, <laughs> um, for example, you need a million sites to get to a new of three. Um, and actually, there's, you know, it's not totally inconsistent with some of the numerics that are out there. Um, there there's some sort of quasi um, uh, numerical studies involving much larger volumes. Um, but then you, okay, um, with, with a nod towards Sal's talk last night, um, yeah, I think he said that the largest volume that you could possibly consider uh, in our universe anyway is 10 to the 60. <laughs> so in that case, nu would turn out to be 7, the power of a double log. <laughs> but just as an aside, though, you know, um, um, just as a bit of a rebuttal to some statements he made at the end of the talk. Uh, uh, he made the proposal that the width, uh, uh, the transition point was a function of L, when was proportional to L. Um, and although, you know, I admit that, um, as, as I've always said, my theorem is always about extremely large W or extremely small couplings may or may not be relevant for experiments. Um, but once you make a proposal that the width, the critical width of the transition width is proportional to L, then that immediately puts it into my ballpark, right? Because then all you have to do is take L to be very large, and then the width is as large as you want, whether it be 20, 40, 80, 160, whatever, it just gets larger with L. And so um, uh, this proposal is essentially ruled out by the theorem that I discussed yesterday. I do admit, however, that the chances of seeing this detailed critical behavior in some kind of real experimental or numerical system are pretty tiny. So this, uh, this is still essentially the realm of theoreticians um, where you could say they're all, we're all arguing about the number of angels that can fit on the out of a pin, but um, still, people do care about this transition. People keep coming back to it, even though doubters, they keep coming back <laughs> and um, talking about phenomena such as um, rare regions and whatnot, which are which require even in cells talk yesterday, you would require millions of sites to see the effect of these rare regions. If you, unless you put them in by hand. So um, I think it's, it's clear that uh, theoreticians, 
uh, in this audience and in general do care about universality classes, even if at the end of the day there's little chance to see them experimentally. Um, okay, so this slide I basically already mentioned, but uh, there's logarithmic slowdown along the separate tracks and new equals infinity. That's in common with the KT flow. But in the KT um, flow, you find that progress is slow both along the separate tricks and orthogonal to it. So we have exponential divergence from the separate tricks along with slow project progress along it. And this leads to an unusual degree of sensitivity to the initial condition. If you're trying to uh, make the system remain critical at large length scales. So in fact, this actually creates <laughs> new experimental challenges uh, on top of all the other ones. Um, and let me, actually, let me just jump to this. So this is now an actual plot of this um, equivalent flow equation. Although the, what we have discussed so far is the recursion, you can actually define a continuous flow equation, which has the very same behavior as um, the discrete recursion. Um, and so then you can plot the flow lines of this, and we again see this separate tricks. Here I'm plotting with respect to square root of y, so, it, so I can sort of decompress what's going on near the x-axis. Um, so from the point of view of sensitivity, actually, uh, you know, I was sort of stupidly trying to create a plot like this by choosing initial conditions extremely close to the separate tricks. And then I found that, you know, if I wanted it to stay critical, let's say down to here, I had to choose the initial conditions like to 12 decimals and stuff, and then it was 16 decimals. And uh, of course, <laughs> it's much better to run the equations in reverse. And <laughs> but this is, a, <clears throat> this is really a sign of the fact that the precision needed to remain critical is quite extreme because of this exponential departure away from the separate trick. This flow equation is kind of interesting. Um, because of the appearance of logarithms, um, why do you need logarithms in this flow equation? Well, if we go to the original flow equation, the previous flow equation, which uh, is here, there's a squaring operation. Well, <clears throat> the only way to do a squaring operation at a differential level is to involve logs. And so, and this is in fact, as I said, uh, this flow equation really does repeat that operation of squaring when, when evaluated at discrete times. Uh, this, of course, was always a continuous, uh, this, of course, was always a continuous equation. That remains unchanged. Now, <clears throat> the early um, uh, uh, proposals for KT universality class um, Quite naturally, you know, they said, well, we have two parameters. We assumed analyticity. And once, if you combine those two things, a fixed line um, and analytic form of the flow equation, pretty much you're bound to end up in the KT universality class. So that was the justification, quite reasonable, for proposing KT universality for the NBL transition. <clears throat> um, and, uh, you know, not to say that I'm Guessing them, but I was very much indebted to those proposals for considering um, uh, <clears throat> this improvement upon them. Uh, <clears throat> and in fact, it was, yeah, seeing um, Vasseur's talk um, like four or five years ago in um, the Galileo Institute, which really got me thinking along these lines. Um, oh, yeah, so let me. Um, just mentioned this other approximation, which I mentioned in the early part of the talk. When we have nu equals infinity, effectively, that justifies the neglect of spatial fluctuations in X. Uh, there's this chase in, at all inequality, nu greater than or equal to two. Well, first of all, obviously, nu equals infinity satisfies this inequality, so that box has been checked. But what, what this really means, and this is really the physics underlying the chase at all inequality, it tells us that the fluctuations of size lambda to the minus a half in X, if we assume some sort of IID central limit theorem type behavior, they're going to be small in comparison to the actual displacement. 
delta zero to the minus one over nu, that is needed to depart the vicinity of the separatrix at scale lambda. Um, in fact, this is quite a bit smaller than this, right? So, because uh, this is logarithmic. In this way, um, we can adjust, neglect those fluctuations in x. Because uh, actually, um, Morningstar and Hughes had a more complicated flow equation, um, FRG, which did not neglect the flow of x. And um, so we had to take that, put in the assumption of constant x, and then make those additional approximations to get to the two-dimensional flow. OK, so um, the last thing I want to do is, um, is now this is a traditional KT flow here equation, which I plugged from, I believe it was Vassar's paper. But um, um, <laughs> there is actually you know, some loose parallels, even if the details of the RG are not the same, different universality class. But like the KT problem, you have, where you have vortices, the T blocks represent non-perturbative effects. And the tendency of those effects to grow or shrink with the flow is what determines the phase diagram. And so in the vortex problem, you have vortex binding, which neutralizes uh, those charged objects in, uh, like say, the Coulomb gas picture of KT. They bind up and they're neutral. Well, that's analogous to T block erasure, um, as we've been discussing. When the T blocks are small, they're effectively removed from the problem. But when bound, vortices renormalize the stiffness. Um, and likewise, when eliminated, T blocks would normalize the decay rate. So there's a nice uh, parallel between these two problems. Uh, and I've already mentioned this at this factor involving logarithms, um, really distinguishes it from the earlier works. By the way, this um, whole analysis um, has been generalized in a recent paper uh, where they look at correlated disorder. The sums of n disorder variables scales as n to the gamma, where gamma is different from the central limit value of 1 half. Uh, and what they found was that this critical theory was found to be universal both for uh, uh, gamma greater than gamma half, which is positively correlated disorder, or for gamma less than half, which is hyper-uniform disorder. I think maybe they were hoping that there might be some way to push this down to quasi-periodic disorder. Um, but, uh, which, you know, obviously is kind of hyper-uniform, but unfortunately the nature of the transition for quasi-periodic disorder remains an open question. Um, <laughs> notwithstanding very many smart people looking at it, um, I think it's still uh, a wide open question. So, uh, anyway, um, uh, <laughs> so that just to point out, Vasseur, which was one of the early KT people was very influential in getting me interested in this problem. So he's on board with this um, new form of um, uh, new proposal for the critical behavior of KT involving these logarithms. So I think it's, I think at least the uh, theoretical community is converging around this concept. So thank you very much for your attention and um, uh, and again, for my invitation uh, to visit uh, this institute and uh, meet all of you. Questions? Uh, I guess it's kind of a technical question. Um, so when you replaced the uh, discrete update to y by this uh, continuous um, uh, version, is that like an exact replacement that works for all y, or is that only for small y? Well, uh, the whole RG is uh, is under the assumption of small y. So, um, so in that context, um, it's a it's accurate to that degree of approximation. Let me let me just clarify. You know, maybe it looks a little mysterious. I didn't really explain. Um, this weird factor of log y over log x minus 2. But remember, if you're on the separatrix, y is x squared, right? <laughs> so log y over log x is 2. <laughs> uh, so this is 0. So 
uh, this really clearly has the same separate tricks as the um, discrete flow. Yeah, maybe I should just like work through it. But uh, you said that like at like uh, observing it uh, uh, at every kind of like interval where x is like updated by by enough, yeah. this reproduces like y goes to y on x squared. Yeah, yeah, um, that's that's not difficult to show. I mean, obviously, okay. I'm not going to do it here, but okay. if but you just integrate the flow equation over that period of time. You get the other. Uh, you get the discrete one. They're they're very close to one another. Okay, right, and and that's true for for all y and x, for, with that form. Subject to our approximations, yeah. Okay. This reminds a bit of the situation with classes where um, years and years of numerical thing never resolved anything. Um, because it simply was too hard and it's too far away. But then the reason, the very reason why it didn't resolve also meant that experimentally it was irrelevant, the question. So you could do a theory of glasses and you should, even assuming that there is no such transition and so on. Isn't there a theory that one can do that somehow concerns real systems where you don't really ask if this is a true transition but then you can say relevant things for the crossovers and what happens in those cases um yeah so uh okay so yeah so let's say um we want to descend to the real world and um consider modest sized systems from 20 to 100 or something like that and um so this, well, this is a study of, of basically crossover phenomena. And um, <clears throat> so very often it helps to have a complete theory of the idealized limit um, if you're going to develop a theory of what happens in the crossover. And um, uh, <clears throat> so, so that would be perhaps one way of arguing for the utility of these theories uh, that are applicable to arbitrarily large volumes. Um, and I think there's quite a bit of work going on now about the nature, uh, what types of resonances are producing the phenomena that are observed uh, in numerics. Um, and so this is really an active um, area of research. Uh, and as far as the critical phenomena that are seen in this, in this today's lecture, it's hard to believe that this really plays much of a role <laughs> uh, in um, modest sized systems um, because you know we have all these jumps and scales and uh, even pretend potentially you could argue that um, uh, the avalanche phenomena itself is hard to observe in experiments where you don't um, explicitly put them in by hand, put in the resonant regions by hand. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of work to be done um, to polish up our understanding theoretically of what's going on in the crossover, crossover region. And, uh, and I um, certainly uh, applaud those folks who are looking into that problem. Yeah, I missed the first five minutes of my talk, but I couldn't get why the specific model you chose helped in this entire analysis, like this Ising model with everything random. Why was that necessary? Uh, okay, uh, so now you're basically talking about um, necessary from the point of view of the proof that you have MBL uh, in arbitrarily large volumes. Um, <clears throat> well, I, I think... Um, the main reason for choosing that problem was um, that it was the simplest for me to work with. Uh, that <clears throat> um, conceptually, it's easier for me to think about spin systems, flipping, just having that one um, flip term that proportional to sigma x. Um, every, uh, sort of <clears throat> proportional to um, sigma x flipping from up to down, and then uh, <clears throat> um, so just basically simplifying the off-diagonal nature of the problem, similar to the way you, in the Anderson model, right? You you have diagonal disorder, and the simplest thing to do is just to take nearest neighbor hopping, right? I was doing basically the same thing, 
in this space has been configurations. Yes, but uh, was it necessary to take like every uh, coefficient random? I mean, what does that help? We could have chosen one to be non-random, right? Still disordered model? Yeah, so um, I talked about this yesterday. The, um, the, the key question that I needed to address with that assumption uh, was the, I wanted to, I needed to know that the probability of this large block being resonant with that large block were small. And um, so think of each block as a system of level spacings. I need to make sure that, because what happens is you jump down here and you jump up here, right? And the result, if there's a level spacing match, the combination has almost zero energy change. You have a zero energy denominator. So how do we know that these level spacings nowhere are going to match up precisely with those mid-level spacings? Well, I have a kind of a breather mode where I can blow the whole Hamiltonian in and out by a constant factor. That's in that high dimensional space of randomness. And when you do that, that does exactly what I need to do and make sure that these do not resonate with those. Any other question? Okay, so let's thank John again.